very excited to be here and uh, it's going to be an uh, exciting topic, uh, I'm sure, so we'll try our best. Uh, yes, so my name is Valery. Uh, I am um, going to be doing a talk today and Veronica is, is going to be doing a tutorial. So uh, we are going to be talking about probabilistic prediction, in particular conform prediction, which is a sort of subject of my uh, PhD. And uh, for any of you who have followed me on social media, you know I'm kind of um, trying to promote it quite heavily in the industry. So I'll explain for the reasons why, uh, because it's quite uh, simply uh, a very awesome uh, sort of topic to, to learn about, right? And uh, yeah, so I am a data scientist. As I mentioned, I did a PhD with Vladimir Wolf, who is a creator of conformal prediction in Royal Holloway University of London in the UK. Uh, published a number of papers in uh, some of the leading machine uh, learning journals, including Neurocomputing, Jill Mara, uh, Machine Learning Journal, so on and so forth. And after my PhD, I have created awesome conformal prediction, which is essentially uh, what some people call superstore for all things conformal prediction, which is uh, I'm going to be sort of talking about a little bit today. So it has um, become quite a popular resource with uh, 1800 stars on github and uh, the idea basically is like if you would like to learn about it or uh, you're doing some research or you would like to build some models this is the place to go and you can pick up anything that sort of suits your uh, problem uh, perhaps in the data science uh, kind of uh, problem solving or like some some papers for your research uh, and uh, i'm going to be also talking briefly about at the end I'm currently uh, writing a book uh, which is uh, focused more on the practical side uh, to apply conform predictions. Uh, there are some uh, uh, very good books uh, focusing on research, but this is basically uh, the idea is to have kind of uh, more comprehensive um, uh, book uh, focused on um, on practice, right? So, you know, you can you can check out the link if you're interested and, you know, there is also like a slide at the end. So that's about me, really. And uh, over to you, Veronica. Yep. Um, I mean, I am, I guess, like the organizer of this group. There's some feedback. Okay. Um, anyway, um, I have a degree in computer science and some background in meteorology. Uh, I'm very interested in machine learning and like, I think it's very useful. Um, and I will be answering questions in the chat uh, throughout Valeria's presentation and um, anything I can't answer, he'll answer at the end. Uh, and at the end, I will also do a little tutorial for how to use a uh, library that basically does what Blair is going to talk about um, for your machine learning model. All right, shall we, oh, yeah. shall can, we start? Go ahead. Okay. So uh, we, just about timelines, we have about, I think, uh, 35 to 40 minutes uh, for the talk. So and then we'll have a Q&A session about five minutes and uh, uh, Veronica will uh, will do tutorials, so let's let's uh, let's get correct on right. So uh, yeah, today I'm going to be talking about machine learning for probabilistic prediction, but essentially focusing on conformal prediction, which I already mentioned is um, something which is a subject, and this is uh, what we're we going to be covering today. Uh, sort of a brief intro to probabilistic um, prediction. We'll talk a little bit about calibration and why is it important, uh, and then we'll talk about like different. Um, examples are for classification regression and also like conformal prediction beyond tabular data so if some of you have already seen like tutorial on uh, conformal prediction uh, it's more like focused on vision this is kind of more focused on what's uh, uh sort of the most relevant problems for for for, for industry and this is of course tabular data right so 80 percent or even more uh, for any companies uh, covering classification or regression but we'll also be uh, kind of uh, covering what's uh, developments in uh, conformal prediction. Very excited, um, exciting things. Uh, so let's let's start first. You know why why do we need probabilistic prediction, right? So uh, you probably know that machine learning is primarily concerned. We're talking about supervised uh, machine learning here with producing uh, a mapping. It's a function which maps uh, labels or uh, features into labels, right? So in uh, classification, we're talking about classes. It could be binary classification. It could be multi-class. In regression, we have continuous in Y, right? So we are trying to predict Y hat, which is our best prediction for, 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 for regression task. And, you know, if you kind of look historically uh, how, how this kind of technology is developed. So we first had classical statistical techniques, of course, uh, for smaller scale, low dimensional data, right? So and uh, that this tend to be like variables, uh, you know, it's parametric. Um, parametric models uh, and then um, things started to move into uh, 
high dimensional data and uh, more data in general, big data, right? You probably heard the term many, many times. So, and people understood that its uh, statistical techniques are kind of not coping well. So they started to develop uh, many of the well-known machine learning models, uh, starting with support vector machines, which was very popular about 20 years ago. And then uh, the things that we kind of know these days that work well, uh, in particular, booster trees, uh, trees like uh, XGBoost, uh, like GBM, so on and so forth, uh, random force, right? So uh, in industry, uh, and one of the reasons of this talk is like we are trying to kind of uh, promote these tools for uh, for the industry, essentially, uh, is uh, there's still, uh, in my opinion, um, quite a large focus on point predictions. And the uncertainty is often overlooked, right? Uh, overlooked. So we'll talk about like why, why it's important. So let's start. Let's start first with the critical applications, consequential applications. And you know the clear examples would be something like finance, health, right? Uh, Self-driving cars, where the cost of the mistake is is quite significant. So over here we have a couple of a uh, couple of examples, and this is from uh, Michael Jordan uh, uh, talk on confirmed prediction. You can find it on YouTube if you're interested. It's very interesting. So a couple of examples: one from health, another one from self-driving cars, right? So if you're looking at, uh, for example, MRI image and now machine learning model uh, produces some output, right? So for doctors uh, and medical practitioners, it's not sufficient to know, you know, what 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 are we looking at, right? Is that potentially like a cancer here? Or you know what is like the uh, probability of this cancer? Is this correct probability? Uh, you know, are there any other things perhaps uh, uh, not as bad as cancer? Maybe there is a concussion, right? So we want to uh, to make predictions uh, which are calibrated and they give us like good probabilities of of what is actually happening. And in medical domain, you know, uh, both sort of excluding uh, bad things, uh, but also including perhaps um, less bad things. Um, is, is important, right? So we want to understand the full kind of range of pot potential kind of labels that could be present here, right? So in um, self-driving cars, uh, you know, uh, obviously there are a lot of applications, one of which is detection of obstacles perhaps on the road or pedestrians, more importantly, right? So a self-driving car has to decide is the pedestrian on the road and, you know, uh, how confident are we when our model says that there is no pedestrian on the road, right? So it's very important to, to kind of not only say is a potentially pedestrian on the road, but provide good probability of this prediction. So I'm going to be talking about what, what good means, but uh, we also like some news um, from Tesla and other self-driving mean, cars that are kind of knocking off um, um, trailer trucks uh, from time to time, so on and so forth, right? So in a nutshell, our point predictions are not enough. That's certainly the case in uh, consequential apl uh, applications in, in, in health and driving cars, finance um, and um, other industries. And also people talk, uh, as you probably know, about explainability and also fairness, right? So this is very, very important. And this is all connection to uh, connected to uh, quantifying consultant. So uh, if we deep dive a little bit uh, into classification, so what do we actually want from our models, right? It's not sufficient to say, is there like a uh, pedestrian on the road or not? We have to produce a well-calibrated probability for that, right? Or like a multi-class, and uh, Veronica is going to be doing tutorial today on multi-class. Uh, so we, you know, we would like uh, not just kind of um, uh, the best label, but also we want to have probabilities of all the labels, right? Uh, in Prediction, and when I say prediction, I try to kind of not use term forecasting unless it's time series. So talking about prediction in a kind of ID setting, a prediction uh, intervals is, is actually much more valuable than producing point predictions. And we are going to be talking about uh, different examples. Time series as well, uh, we would like to have prediction intervals. And in many industries, uh, this is uh, incredibly important, right? In demand planning, if you think about it, you know, to plan the uh, stock levels and plan kind of so that the customers are not left without the goods and we don't kind of overstock, you, you have to know the distribution of like um, forecast, right? Systematic trading and finance, of course, are very, very important for making uh, decisions, uh, energy price forecasting, where companies, uh, producers in particular, have to submit uh, Focus into the grid how much energy they're going to produce. They're interested in like the whole kind of uh, prediction interval or even better like uh, uh, CDF yeah, uh, for, for, the, for the prediction. So in a nutshell, uh, what we need from machine learning models is not only provide a point forecast, but also a practical measure of the evidence found in support of its predictions, right? So 
essentially we're asking the model how confident are you of producing this forecast right? and this is actually a phrase that has been used in i think um, you know uh, in one of the first papers if not the first papers on um, conformal prediction and this is called learning by transduction transduction this was like a sort of framework name at the time and that was um, you know uh, the sort of the inventors are uh, Vladimir Wolf as I mentioned my supervisor Alex Gammerman also based in Royal Holloway in the UK and Wapnik was also quite involved at the time um, not anymore but he, he actually contributed quite um, uh, some good ideas so uh, let's talk about the sources of uncertainty if you look at uncertainty um, where does it come from right the kind of one big distinction is um, aleatoric um, uncertainty and epistemic uncertainty so essentially i put it here right so you know so no no you know it's very easy to kind of understand aleatoric uncertainty is due to randomness right so we see like a cloud of points here so that's that's that randomness happens regardless of the model that we fit in or not right and epistemic uncertainty refers to uncertainty caused by lack of knowledge right so if you put a straight line here we can see that the areas where there are no points of course we don't know, know much about these regions so we refer to these areas as areas of high epistemic uncertainty so natural question would be what kind of uncertainty conform prediction is and the, the good answer is that actually it doesn't care right so it sort of quantifies the whole uncertainty so we do not care whether it comes from randomness per se or our model you know as long as we build uh, a point predictor and we put conform prediction on top we catch and we can catch this total uncertainty which is good news so let's talk about calibration uh, so how do we define calibration um, the key concept is um, that for for our model outputs uh, the realization of what's actually happening uh, should kind of match match uh, our predictions what does it mean so for example if you look at this for formula if you want to predict probability of rain tomorrow right and we say our model outputs probability of rain is 70 percent uh in in the days on which we predict probability of the day of 70 percent the, the kind of frequency of this day should be 70 percent it's quite simple as that right so in effect we want a model that kind of matches the reality right when we kind of look at actual realizations and you know we say our model is uh well calibrated and this is like kind of desired or actually uh, required property of any probabilistic model right so uh many of these concepts are not new they've been around for some time and in particular if you look at uh, weather forecasting right so these uh, folks were early pioneers of many fundamental concepts so you can see here the paper goes back to 1950 right glenn Breer uh, was actually um you know he's invented several concepts in particular um he, he invented a Breer score which is you can see a formula here which is essentially what I just described. So we have frequencies of events and we have kind of uh, predictions and we want to make sure the kind of square difference is uh, is minimized. Right? It's very similar to what we, what we do in a regression task, but here we, we of course have classification task. And as I mentioned, 70 chance, 70% 70 chance of rain should be followed by rain 70% of the time on the days where we predicted 70% of chance of rain. Right? So in effect, we have to match you know uh, predictions of our model to what is going to happen and natural question might might be asked does it even matter right so we already talked about consequential settings high risk settings like health care or perhaps uh, uh, self-driving cars or even like things like you know shall we issue to this person a mortgage right so we we would like to have a pretty good uh, prediction of probability is this person is, is gonna is going to be defaulting uh, on the mortgage or not, not only because we don't want to lose money, right? But we also, uh, you know, we also uh, working, of course, in a regulated industry, financial industry, which is, uh, uh, you know, has to follow certain regulations, right? So in particular, there is a lot of talk about fairness, right? So we, we have to make sure uh, we, we produce like explanations for our models, right? And we also produce like uh, good predictions uh not just uh, in general but tailored to a specific person right so if you take a specific person you know it has to be kind of uh, a well calibrated probability which is also fair so another example is like you know we compare two models and i'll show you uh, in a second uh, an example uh we have two models and they're kind of providing predictions point predictions which are similar but which which model produces uh high confidence right so we, we want to obviously pick a model which has high confidence right because we know that in reality will be uh, more correct 
And I mentioned, uh, you know, this is a topic of increasing interest. So if you go on uh, like um, YouTube and uh, you, you'll see some talks by Emmanuel Candes, who is uh, one of the leading um, researchers in general in math. He's the chair of uh, mathematics and statistics department at Stanford. He also does a lot of um, conformal prediction research. There is a talk uh, from him where he talks about uh, fairness, trust and explainability, right? So essentially uh, what we hear from all those experts, you know, uh, is that to trust predictions, we need to, to make sure that uh, we need to understand how certain these predictions are, right? So you see a, a quote here from uh, Christoph Molna, who is an expert on, on XI, right? So he has, uh, wrote a book about it. And, you know, you would hear from uh, from various experts like this that explainability is not is not possible without understanding how certain the predictions are, right? So let's just look at a very simple example. You know, this is again, this is not a uh kind of not always uh, a critical uh, industry right but i mentioned in finance you know we have regulations but even like leaving aside the regulations so let's let's look at uh you know a company or a bank perhaps uh, investing into two portfolios uh you know we have a value of the portfolio uh, say it's 100 million to 150 million and we have default probability right so what do this what will this company do it will compute probability of default multi multiplied by value and you have expected loss right so you have like you know, if you have like a portfolio up to 150 and you have to invest into one, you pick up this one, of course, right? Because it's kind of low expected loss. Uh, but we have to ask ourselves the question, how good these probabilities are, right? So I'm going to be talking about uh, it uh, in, in a few slides that actually no model produces well calibrated probabilities. So what happens if we got them like just slightly wrong, right? So imagine this was true probabilities, right? So we do the same exercise. We multiply the probability by the value. And now we see a completely different outcome, right? So we actually have to invest into portfolio A to minimize our loss uh, compared to portfolio B, right? So, and this is like an example which shows even if the industry is not regulated, right? Or perhaps not like very high risk decisions. So no kind of pedestrians on the road are involved or no kind of patients at, at risk. Uh, you know, we have to make sure that our probabilities are correct, right? So it's just an illustration. So how do people measure uh, calibration, right? Uh, this is uh, an example uh, of one of the tools. Uh, it's called reliability diagram or calibration diagram. And essentially, I mentioned the probability of rain. You know, if you, if you took a bucket of those days, we predict probability of 70% of the rain, we have to make sure it's kind of actual accuracy uh, is 70%, uh, right? So we kind of provide a, a label of one where there is rain with 70% of the time, right? This is ideal. So you see this is 45 degrees uh, line, and this is what we want to have. But in reality, we have a very different situations, and most of the models produce either that, you know, and you see this is like underconfident, which means the kind of actual posterior probability is, is, is lower than what we predicted, or vice versa, and this is actually a, a, a worse situation uh, where the model is overconfident, right? And many of the models are actually overconfident, in particular deep learning. So I'm going to be showing you some examples and some um, papers. Uh, it's been demonstrated time and again. You know, this is what is, is going to be happening, right? So if we use our model out of the box, you can see there is a mismatch, right? And the, the bigger the gap, the bigger the kind of um, impact uh, in terms of decision making, whether it's uh, consequential settings like in healthcare or somewhere, or maybe even like in, in the finance, right? So, you know, now that we know these things can happen, we're asking the question, you know, are machine learning models well calibrated? And the kind of rule of thumb in general is no, right? And this is known for some time, right? So the first studies uh, kind of date to uh, about 20 years ago. So I'm going to be talking about plus calibration where people already knew support vector machines are not calibrated, so they created, created some tool uh, called plot scaling to kind of rectify that. And there was also like a very uh, uh, classical study that has a lot of citations which uh, made certain claims. So they said, okay, uh, we know booster trees are miscalibrated, it's still true. Uh, but they also like made claims that were later debunked. Uh, for example, it was claimed that shallow neural networks are well calibrated, but actually they're not. Uh, it was revisited in the more kind of latest papers where it was shown neural networks both, you know, shallow and deep are miscalibrated. And this paper is particularly interesting, you know, if somebody wants to uh, to check, like, when did people actually realize deep learning was miscalibrated, you have to kind of Google Google for this uh, paper by Guo. Uh, and it also has, like, a talk on video, which is quite interesting. So you can see a lot of papers and, you know, uh, um, 
as I mentioned, most of them are miscalibrated. Uh, I mean, perhaps the, the least miscalibrated is logistic regression, but of course it's a very simple algorithm. It's not um, sufficiently powerful. And we talked about consequential uh, industries, right? So healthcare and so on so, and so forth. But interestingly enough, even like in uh, high tech companies, like, you know, uh, somebody who, who, who worked for Meta, they actually mentioned to me that uh, uh, Meta is actually very interested in, in calibrating predictions. Uh, so because 90% of the profits come from advertising, right? So in advertising, you have some certain bidding process. And similar to what I've shown you uh, for these portfolios, you have to make sure the kind of uh, financial impact is calculated correctly and also ranking, right? So this is like some papers. Um, this is mostly like following uh, both like classical machine learning, more recently deep learning, and people were proposing some um, some methods, right? Mostly like parametric methods. And um, uh, many of them have like certain advantages, but also disadvantages. If you're really interested, you can read um, chapter two in my uh, I covered quite a lot of this. Um, so let's let's look at um, the kind of early methods. Plot scaling uh, goes back to 2001, if I remember top of my head. So what did Plot do? Is notice that uh, when uh, people applied support vector machine, and bear in mind at the time it was like number one machine learning model, everybody was doing support vector machine. Um, and he said, look, this looks like um, sigmoid, right? So why don't you not just model it as a sigmoid? And he proposed this kind of parametric form. This is conditional probability plus one, and we just need to figure out A and B. And he kind of described in his paper how to estimate A and B, right? Uh, and uh, it kind of worked well uh, for uh, support vector machine. But what happened uh, after that, um, you know, it was a bit of like, um, uh, let's use this kind of uh, hammer to to nail everything, right? And people started to apply it to to other things, but of course, you know, it, it relies on on this kind of sh shape of sigmoid. But uh, many other uh, models do not produce a sigmoid shape, and of course, uh, the result would be uh, quite often even worse, right? So you cannot just use plot scaling to to to, to calibrate everything, and Plot didn't do any kind of mass at the time. He just kind of produced this form. But more recently, uh, in, 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 in 2017 paper, pe people actually have proven that using plot scalar is, is um, tantamount to very restrictive assumptions, in particular normality and homoscedasticity, so, uh, which actually never happens in, in real life, right? So, you know, it just tells us again, we cannot uh, use this hammer to, to kind of nail everything. So in about 2002, another very popular um, model came out, and this is like non-parametric, right? And essentially, uh, what it does, we we want to kind of we have this kind of cloud of points, and we want to produce um, kind of better calibrated predictions. And we we also know that you know ideally, um, you know, if the score, this is like a class score is increasing, then the probability should also be increasing, right? And uh, isotonic regression was proposed, which is a very fast uh, model. So it's ON, it's very fast um, to, to compute. And essentially what it does is kind of comes, starts from here, and then it just kind of scans the space and moving one step at a time and sort of swaps the points where there is like violation of this order. And this is also like um, very popular, but uh, you know, when there is a tool, there is also assumptions, right? So we have to, to kind of ask, you know, could this tool be always used and what what's its drawbacks? So it turns out uh, that um, isotonic regression tends to overfit on the smaller data sets. And also, of course, I mentioned it relies on a model producing perfect ranking, which is, as you know, uh, is equivalent to Roka Oak of one, which is never happening in real life, right? And unless we know the distribution. So now coming to conform prediction. So uh, what is it? It's, it's essentially the way to think about it, it's like a calibration layer, right? So we, we have a state of the art model. It could be as complex as, as you like, or it could be as simple as you like. We, we kind of abstractly think about it. any model. It could be statistical, deep learning, or machine learning, or even perhaps uh, some business heuristics or like expert predictions, right? So what conform prediction does, it's like a layer on top, right? It doesn't, it doesn't kind of interfere with the box. Uh, doesn't need to even understand what's inside the box. It's basically just calibrate predictions, uh, and it it doesn't require like variance estimation or things like this. It doesn't require um, uh, Bayesian assumptions, right? We 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 need no priors, right? And it's essential for decision making, risk control, and assembling modules. So in effect, it kind of enables or better decisions downstream, right? 
So this is again Michael Jordan uh, on conform prediction, highly recommended talk, so you can watch it. And um, Michael Jordan, and if you don't know, he's one of the leading machine learning researcher, researchers. So he, he kind of calls this dubious UQ, right? Dubious uncertainty quantification, because, you know, as we already know, no model produces um, uh, well calibrated predictions. Uh, the history of conform prediction is Kolmogorov's complexity, right? So it's like algorithmic theory. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, it was developed by my supervisor. I mentioned he was last, last PhD student of Kolmogorov, right? So some ideas goes back to, to his discussions with Kolmogorov himself at the time. And it converts any point predictors into probabilistic predictors, right? So by that, I mean, like, whether classification or regression on time series, it re literally doesn't care. Uh, and later on, we'll see, you know, it can be applied to reinforcement learning. It can be applied to... Uh, uh, pretty much everything, right? Whereas well, there is uncertainty involved, it can calibrate it, right? So it's a non-invasive calibration layer, which is very, very important because if you can imagine this model was already deployed into production, uh, nobody in business wants to kind of tamper with it, right? Because something bad might happen. So we can just kind of bundle calibration layer on top. Uh, and unless, you know, with other approaches, of course, Bayesian requires completely like redesigning the box, right? So we cannot do it, uh, but here we can just kind of put an extra layer and it outputs well calibrated probabilities, right? By default, right? So here is like a good thing about it. It actually does it every time and all the time, no matter what model it is, as soon as it is a model from any conformal prediction framework, right? So this mathematical guarantees, they come statistical guarantees, they come for free and they come as a kind of um, guardrail by default, right? So you should not be worried that your model will be miscalibrated as long as they use model from conformal prediction framework correctly. So it doesn't need any prior probabilities, right? So of course, uh, in Bayesian approach, people need prior probabilities and the issue that happens with them, unless they're kind of absolutely correct, and we know that that doesn't happen, you know, unless it's synthetic data set, it can be shown that Bayesian learning uh, outputs posteriors in the wrong place of the wrong shape. So imagine a situation you have a data set with a lot of uh, uncertainty and you get posterior, which is kind of nicely bell shaped, but in the wrong place, right? So it doesn't even warn you that actually there is a lot of uncertainty and we perhaps like without making a critical decision, like in a medical setting, doctor should say, you know, actually, I don't know. I have to, to ask another doctor, right? So with conform prediction, you do not have that. So there is no priors. And of course, in high uncertainty situations, you'll just get a kind of let posterior. We don't call it posterior, but in, in fact, it's like to, to, to talk about comparable uh, sort of lexicon views uh, posterior, just for this example. And the only assumption is that of exchangeability, right? So which is a weaker form of ID. We know machine learning is based on ID because that's required for learning, right? So machine learning is 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 able to models are able to learn because they kind of already saw the data from the same distribution right and this is like a weak assumption in that right uh and you know more recently uh, there has been a lot of like successful extension of conform prediction beyond exchangeability it's a very popular topic in research including in time series right so there is a lot of um very interesting papers and also implementations i'll talk uh, about some of them uh in terms of both research and applications, right? There are libraries which anybody can run with just a few lines of code. Um, and the, you know, the advantages of machine learning is actually like model agnostic. I mentioned one can use any point predictor, you know, whether it's machine learning, statistical, um, you know, it could be business uh, heuristics or expert predictions. Uh, so this is very, very attractive, right? So, you know, imagine a data science team has already spent like many months building some model uh, for, for the business application, right? So actually, uh, to add uncertainty quantification on top of it, they don't have to do much, right? They just can kind of bundle um, conform prediction, but they actually don't have to re-engineer or redesign uh, the model, which is a very attractive uh, proposition from business viewpoint, right? So validity of predictions and final samples of any size, we talked about 70% probability of rain being matched in the real implement, uh, realizations. And this framework is not new, right? So uh, the first book by Wolf, which was published in 2005, is actually quite a theoretical book. Um, uh, there's been uh, a second edition in 22, uh, and some early papers I mentioned, 1998 paper by Wolf and uh, Wapnik. Uh, so, but what happened for, for a long time, it's sort of stayed beyond the radar as a kind of niche area, right? But there's been absolute explosion during the last two, three years. Uh, if you followed me on LinkedIn, you can see, um, you know, a lot of 
things have happened. So first in academia, now in the industry, right? A lot of people are interested in this um, framework because it works and it's very simple uh, to learn and apply. And, you know, uh, it could be done with just a few lines of code. So here's like what some of the most influential uh, researchers in uh, machine learning and statistical space have to say. So Michael Jordan, basically he's, um, um, you know, he's promoting this um, this framework quite heavily in academia. And, you know, one of the reasons it kind of took off and Larry Wasserman, if you know, he's a, a very big uh, professor in statistics in Carnegie Mellon. So he was actually, Larry converted uh, Michael and Michael is kind of converting everybody else in academia. So uh, you see what they have to say. I don't, I'm not going to read about it, but let's look at a bit more at how uh, how it could be done. So it's essentially what we want to have, if you are predicting a label, uh, whether in classification or regression task, we want to have, uh, you know, actual labels or uh, within this predict prediction set that we generate, right? Whether it's in classification as several labels or prediction interval, and we want to have it um, uh, occurring with the probability that we select, right? So we, we select this, um, for, for example, confidence uh, level of 90%, and we want to make sure without even seeing this label that, you know, when actual events happen, that these events happen, you know, with uh, with probability uh, exceeding the significance level that we selected, right? And this is very, very attractive. Of course, here, you know, we, we are talking about prediction out of sample, right? Nobody knows the future, but we can design uncertainty quantification using conformal prediction in such a way that we actually, uh, we might not know the label exactly, right, but we know within which interval it will fall, right. And here, you know, you can see uh, it does it for any uh, finite sample coverage, right, so uh, which is very, very powerful. As you know, in statistics, uh, we have asymptotic coverage when the number of points uh, tends to infinity, but actually here without any distribution assumptions, we we can do final sample predictions uh, for any predictive model. This is extremely powerful. No other framework does it, right? So what is like the uh, the kind of minuses, so to say? I mean, I would say um, this says conservative high D outputs, but this is for classical, and there are papers that address that. Um, and um, the only kind of thing we have to select here is non-conformity score, right? So this is like the only user input. So let's have a look at a quick example here. So this is like the steps in the regression uh, settings, right? So we have to, every model starts with designing non-conformity function and regression task, it could be as simple as y minus y hat, right? So our, our error. So what we do next, we, we kind of slice out data and uh, proper training set and calibration set. We train the machine learning model on the proper training set, and then we compute these errors on the calibration set. And we use this information uh, to basically um, form a prediction interval, right? So what we do here is essentially uh, we take these errors on the calibration set and we put them like into histogram and we see, we select certain like quantile 95% and we say, okay, uh, for 90% of the points, the kind of error on the calibration set is going to be less than X, right? And we use this kind of X to bundle on top of our uh, point predictions and produce forecast, right? So I'm going, not going to be dwelling upon it here. Uh, you know, if you're interested uh, in kind of doing this call up, actually you just Google uh, Rajiv Shah for conform prediction, he has call up a book here as well. So uh, this is how it looks like, right? So, and the idea is that in our like test sets that, you know, if we specify 95% um, confidence interval, only like 5%, of the points should be out, right? This is like what uh, good calibration means. And here, you know, I have a picture. I mentioned we compute the errors on the calibration set, right? Importantly, not on the training set, right? So training set is separate only for point predictions. We do it on the calibration set. Then we select like 95% uh, percentile and we kind of pick up this point as an absolute error. And we we kind of, you know, we have a point prediction. We kind of take, take a step up and down using this this um, quantile here, and we form our prediction as well. It's like the basic idea is here. Of course, there is a lot of more uh, powerful methods that you know you can um, explore. But yeah, let's uh, you know let's talk about classification a little bit, and um, you know maybe I'll, I'll skip um, that uh, because we have tutorial, right? So uh, essentially, I mentioned uh, conform prediction is is a way to calibrate uh, scores into correct probabilities. 
So you probably saw uh, predict proba in scikit learn. It's actually very misleading. You can read here why. Uh, and it doesn't predict probabilities, right? It predicts uh, the scores. And there are some ways. So uh, I'm gonna probably be skipping that. When numbers is, is, you can read about it. It basically calibrates probabilities, one of the ways to do it. Uh, this is from, our, from, from, from my paper. It can be extended to multi class. Again, I, I skip that. Um, so if you're interested about regression, uh, there are various things you can do. You can do prediction intervals. You can also output the whole um, cumulative distribution function, right? So the um, technology that is uh, used uh, to do that is called conformal predictive distributions. So you can go and um, watch tutorials. And uh, currently, it can be done just with, with a few lines of code. Uh, and the library is called uh, Krebs, is a pancakes in French, right? So, and you you know, with this curve, you can do a lot of things. Um, you know, for example, in finance, um, you can uh, not only like do uh, predictions of median or mean, you can compute uh, value at risk. You can do all sorts of things. You know, you can do um, uh, optimization of stocks, for example, in inventory uh, planning, demand planning, and many other things. Right? As soon as you have this curve, the kind of opportunities are boundless. Right? So I'm gonna skip that. This is uh, a bit technical, um, and. How do we measure the calibration and regression setting, right? So I just mentioned this. So one of the best ways to do it is to compute um, conformal uh, is uh, is called um, is uh, conform uh, continuous strength probability score, right? So essentially, what we do, we have this CDF that I mentioned, and we just kind of when we know the actual label, we do a step function, right? And we kind of measure this distance between um, the step function and our CDF with squared. We take an integral. And ideally, our prediction should be like that, right? But of course, when there is uncertainty, it never happens, right? So, so let's let's talk about some uh, examples. We have maybe a few more minutes. So beyond tabular data, right? So uh, for those of you familiar with um, with the subject a little bit, this is actually from uh, from the famous tutorial uh, by Angelopoulos and Bates, right? So there is also a uh, video about it on YouTube, I think it's like 20,000 views. So it's like the talk about uh, uh, computer vision about, right? So we have a picture of squirrel here and it's like very, very clear. So 99% probability is squirrel, right? And then we have a picture here of a squirrel. So it's kind of less clear. So we have 80, 82% and perhaps gray fox. And here we have like a very strange picture. And we don't even know like whether it's a squirrel or marmot, for example, and we, you know, because it's occluded and it, it doesn't sit on the tree or a fence, it's kind of on the a, on a ground. So you can see how in this uncertain situation, we actually have to output many more labels, right? And at least two of them are almost like equal, so we don't even know what it is. So this is actually a better prediction because it allows to kind of both alert the, the users to the, the fact that there is uncertainty, but also enables to uh, quantify this uncertainty, right? Uh, I guess this is also from the same paper, right? So you have like some more examples of what what the picture described, and you can actually see this is like not single tone sets. There is many more things in there. Um, time series I mentioned it's kind of an exploding um, uh, research domain and application domain. So there's been a few um, very interesting papers already, and you know if you're interested in kind of running code or watching some videos, uh, you can find them in on some conform prediction in time series section and uh, there is uh, quite a few libraries that kind of realized uh, both conformal prediction in time series in particular one of the kind of biggest ones is maybe uh, so today in tutorial uh, is going to be maybe is going to be used as key time as well uh, neuro profit nixla amazon fortuna is a kind of newcomer fast growing also has both conformal prediction and time series based uh, forecasting for conformal prediction so here's an example of um, medical domain so mri if you know mri is actually when mri scan is done is that it, it doesn't produce like a complete scan it's using like under sampling right because basically nobody wants to kind of stay in a queue for many hours so it produces like a blurred blurred image and then the image is, is been reconstructed right and of course we want to understand how well uh we capture the uncertainty right so it's not sufficient just to say okay here's like uh, a kind of white picture or more dark picture, right? We want to kind of color them according to the uncertainty. So conform prediction successfully done, uh, does that. And this is like of huge interest to, to hospitals and doctors, uh, so on and so forth, because you can imagine if it's like very precise, then the doctor would probably just kind of look at it and says, okay, I'm actually quite sure there is nothing here, right? But if it's like uncertainty area, then, you know, we have to kind of explore a bit more detail. So this was actually my favorite 
my personal favorite uh, paper from um, from 2022. It's called Confusion. So you can see um, the amazing things uh, it can do, right? So it can kind of output uh, bounds like prediction interval on on the faces, right? And here is like very clear example, right? And uh, this is incredibly powerful, right? So I mentioned conformal prediction is not just used for tabular data, right? It's been applied to all sorts of new technologies, reinforcement learning, um, and also diffusion and things like that, right? So it's um, it's a very kind of prosperous, uh, prosperous area to 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 be applied. Uh, NLP, uh, you know, here is an example of uh, NLP for for medical domain. So shall I take Xanax for anxiety or not? Perhaps so, you know. We want to know whether it's like a certain or uncertain or perhaps re refer to second opinion. Uh, graphs, um, you know, very powerful technology also benefits a lot from uh, conformal prediction. Uh, LLMs, as you're familiar with, is, is, is kind of literally exploding uh, topic. Uh, and one of the kind of biggest uh, drawbacks of LLMs is uh, so-called hallucinations. So uh, and basically hallucinations is, is this kind of is related to uncalibrated probabilities. So, you know, if we actually bundle conformal prediction on top of it, we can demonstrate you see across the very various topics we have obtained good coverage, meaning we are making uh, LLMs more reliable and more robust, right? So this is what we want. So, yes, I mean, just to finish off, uh, so we need to leave some time for, for questions and uh, tutorial. Awesome conformal prediction has pretty much everything, right? So somebody called it a superstore for all things conformal. If you're interested, uh, please go in. There is a link. Please start the repo. Cite it if you're a researcher. Here is like a BibTech expert. Very, very important. And I mentioned uh, the book will be published uh, later in the year or maybe beginning of next year. So I'm currently in the process uh, writing it and it's, it's going to be focusing on um, practical applications, right? So I think that's it. Here's just some of the resources um, I covered uh, in this um, talk, but the best place, of course, is here to go, and you can always find everything um, was in terms of like learning or using or researching. Okay, that's yeah, that's um, let's let's do Q and A session, Veronica. Okay, awesome. Thank you for. Uh, um presenting. Uh, there's definitely a few questions that I feel like you are uh, better um, for answering. I'm like trying to scroll up. OK, um, first one uh, by Ali Hana. Um, they said, I read somewhere, I believe it was your post, but I'm unsure, that what a model outputs when using softmax probabilities isn't actually probabilities. Does this have to do with calibration? Is calibration just that the model's predictions don't reflect the true underlying distribution and thus can't be trusted? Exactly. Yes, that's exactly the point. So, uh, yes, uh, the, uh, the the models output um, class scores, right? And they're not calibrated by default. Uh, so they're just scores, right? Uh, the best way not to think about them as probabilities, right? And just kind of put a calibration layer on top of it and uh, kind of be safe, right? That's perfectly summarized, yes. <clears throat> Cool. Uh, and the next one is from Andre. Uh, he said, hi, Larry, a few questions regarding probability calibration for classifiers. One, can you explain in simple terms impossibility results from the CP book? No. Uh, why is that the case? <laughs> and what does it mean practically? Uh, he doesn't understand the proof. Uh, so. yeah. I, I mean, I'll just explain what impossibility result is, uh, and it's impossible to, <laughs> to at least for <laughs> me to explain it. I'll, I'll Andre, preach, please reach out if I, I'm, I'll manage to explain to you later. Uh, you know, some of the uh, the things that people mention uh, about conform prediction is actually it uh, it provides validity, um, right? But the validity is kind of uh, um, tailored uh, to to the object, but it's kind of an average over the calibration and test set, right? Uh, and uh, you know, people uh, of course want to have conditional val validity, right? Based on uh, you know conditional features, and um, you know this is actually impossible, right? In a kind of stricter sense, uh, you know, if you have features for a particular object, uh, it's impossible to produce uh, uh, produce a valid prediction, uh, not just by using um, conformal prediction, but by any kind of framework or model, right? It's, it's just not possible, right? And it's been proven in Wolf's book. You know, if people are interested in mass, you can go then and 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 have a, have a look. But again, as I mentioned, it's uh, it's it's a, it's a complicated, right? So uh, regarding the numbers, the second question I probably can answer uh, would uh, using something different. Um, yeah, uh, I guess this is like depends on the data set, right? Uh, 
But what also important uh, is to understand that uh, Venabris is kind of a better version of azotonic regression. So it's actually based on azotonic regression, but we do it twice, uh, fitting a label one and, 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 and zero, right? And it's calibrated by default. But I, I do not think, I, I think it has to be tested, right? So, you know, it's not um, it's not like um, theoretic result. Um, Kolmogorov is equal to turbulence. Uh, that's fantastic. I actually have a, a whole article on Medium about Kolmogorov, who is my academic uh, granddad. So he did a lot of contributions, and I think I mentioned turbulence there as well. Ajiv Shah Kolmogorov is an to Yes, uh, I mean, in a way, uh, you can call it a very simple version of uh, confirmed prediction what Rajiv did. But I guess uh, today we're going to be using MAPI, so I would advise uh, kind of not to, not, not, not to create the bike. And in my book, I will be also like producing um, notebooks and covering uh, various examples only using the libraries, right? Because uh, libraries are tested, right? So actually, there are a couple of uh, call-up notebooks already on my book. If you go on the pub publisher's GitHub, right? So you can find and play with classification. Uh, but I, I would like advice when you're building conformal prediction model not to redesign the bike because it's very easy to make mistake just to use one of the libraries, right? How do we check for prediction validity of prediction sets that we get? Well, I mean, if we get actual labels, we can uh, do the, the calibration plot uh, that I showed. Uh, we can also compute various uh, metrics uh, in classification. It could be log loss or Braille loss. This is what we used in all the papers, right? We compute actually both of them because sometimes they give like slightly different results. And essentially, uh, we we kind of if you have a system in production already, uh, you know you can kind of collect labels after it's running and always check that it's well calibrated, right? And if you are using conform predictions, they should be calibrated by default. And if you don't see calibration coming from what you thought was conform prediction models, then you did the model incorrect uh, because it should be calibrated all the time. Uh, that's the naive conform quantile regression. That's excellent answer. Somebody, uh, yes, Veronica, thank you for for answering. Uh, CQR is one of my base, best uh, favorite uh, methods. Um, I, I, I sort of um, I suggest to explore it. Uh, it's a brilliant algorithm. Uh, can you please help me finding? Okay, right. I think I'll share a GIF notebook in the chat. Veronica, so don't don't uh, spend time on it. Um, what else is there? Shall, shall we start with the tutorial and maybe there is how yeah. many? Oh no, that's almost finished. Well, my favorite library is uh, <laughs> for time series. It's <laughs> it's a hard question. Uh, I, I, my, my, my favorite time, uh, time series library is General Nixla, but I think they are frankly a little bit behind the curve as well that they do a lot of great things. Uh, but on the CP, I think they're like, they're still doing some, some great work, right? They, they did uh, for machine learning, but I think for stats models, uh, they're still in process. Uh, MAPI works with XGBoost, yes, for sure. It works with, with pretty much everything. It's like it learned com compliant and it's, it's, it's great. Uh, so yeah, MAPI first for general kind of conform prediction. Uh, there is a bunch of um, uh, other methods for um, uh, for time series forecasting. I mentioned them in the slides. Uh, yeah. What is the problem with using is a tonic method? Uh, well, the problem I mentioned, it overfits on small sets and it also assumes a rock of one. Which is uh, which is nonsensical, right? In in real life, <laughs> the best way to DM me uh, is uh, is uh, DM me on LinkedIn. But uh, I try not to uh, answer questions unless they're conformal prediction related. But you can also uh, Slack me in. Uh, we have a Slack as well on conformal prediction. You can find a Slack link uh, on the awesome conformal prediction. And yeah, so I think we are here. We've covered all the questions. And I, over to you, Veronica. And I'll I'll, I'll post uh, Rajiv's. Um, uh, notebook in the meantime, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, uh, let me share my screen. Um... I stop, I stop. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so I'm probably just going to open up a terminal uh, and like kind of go through um, the notebook step by step. Uh, um, just so that we have like, I don't know, like a consensus of where to go. Um, and yeah, the credit is just for the research publication and the MAPB uh, documents. Um, it's pretty good. Um, okay, so uh, I will assume that most people are at least familiar with the um, general structure of like uh, the machine learning, I guess, uh, pipeline. Um, and this is just very simple. It's honestly like a few more um, lines of code on top of that. Okay, there's a little bit of feedback. 
Um, and here we're just going to be doing a classification program um, problem. Uh, I just generated a data set that is two dimensional with three labels. Um, and I think like a good way to think about it would like an example um, is if it's like a medical uh, data set where there's age and like blood pressure or something. And the three labels are like healthy, uh, disease A, disease B. Um, you want to get a prediction set because you can't like if you if you get a value um, that's like kind of in between those two groups uh, or even like overlapping. Um, if you're a doctor, you can't like discount uh, a disease one way or another, so it has to be included in the uh, prediction set. Um, as like the the rigorous guarantee um, of of the correct answer being in that set, right? Um, okay. These are imports. Um, so yeah, this uh, isn't anything other than like uh, creating the um, data and then visualizing it. You don't need this. Um, the difference um, in the general, uh, I guess, workflow um, is over here when you need to train test split um, into calibration groups as well. Um, so that you can uh, do the like mappy or map I don't know um, map I um, estimator here. Um, okay. I also realized I can't see any um, questions, so I would definitely love to know if anybody has any questions about like. Uh, the variables. Um, so for here, uh, we can see that we get like training, testing, and calibration sets. Um, and then the model doesn't matter um, because it's like model agnostic. Um, like I, I've got a few other ones here that worked as well, but we'll just go with the Gaussian. Oh. Okay. Um, I think my my terminal is out of date. Um, I guess like I don't need this. Anyway, um, the alpha value, I guess, is also um, an important like thing to know. Um, it's just what uh, guarantee you want to have. Um, so for example, uh, 0 0.05 alpha value um, is like you want a 95% guarantee that the set you get for any given point contains the correct answer. Um, these are lesser guarantees. So uh, point 0.1 would be a 90% guarantee that the set contains a um, value and so on. Um, it's like one minus that. And when, when you plot like the quantiles, uh, like the scores, um, you, you can see that it does cover like 95, 90, and 80%. Uh, just like kind of visually sanity checking that. Um, yeah, I guess, yeah, do you get the MAPI class, MAPI classifier? You have to fit the calibration. Um, and you can do any number of alphas. Um, and uh, I guess like, you can see that most of the scores are small and like if you can imagine what like the algorithm is doing it 
goes through the list of scores um, and these are smaller and adds them up like until it, it hits its like quantile um, and then returns that as a set. Uh, there's here, I'm actually gonna pull up, um, not the time series. Sorry, I'm not sure if people can see. Okay, I hope that people can see this window. Um, okay, so um, okay, so this is uh, for classification. Um, I guess you get the output as a prediction set. Uh, what is different with like a time series forecast is that you would get a prediction interval. Um, and this is, whoop, oh gosh, sorry. Um, you can see like, this is a really great visual of what the prediction interval might look like um, and what the calibration does. So here, like you can see what happens without any calibration um the graph just continues going on like as it was and uh thinks that the uh, values would be in this range um but when you include like another round of calibration um in this part of the code then it expands its uh, coverage a lot um to uh make sure that the results are um included in the interval. Uh, so it's like similar idea. Uh, I think it's a different library in Mappy, um, or not a library, it's a different like um, class. Uh, <clears throat> um, and I, I think that's like a good start to that uh, library um, because it's like classification, time series, and it also has a uh, conformal quantile regression, um, which is probably like more useful because it actually changes the um, interval based on the point. It doesn't just blindly apply the same uh, like uh, value, I guess, um, to like inflate the interval. Uh, yeah, let's see. How are we doing on time? It is exactly 1 p.m. Okay. Um, are there any questions? Sounds sounds good, but I think we covered most of them. But if if there are some like um, an odd question or two, happy to to look into them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I mean, uh, we're we're on time. Well, I guess that is all. Yeah. Thank you both so so much for sharing all your knowledge with the meetup. Um, yeah, sorry, so, that was a little rushed. <laughs> no worries, that was amazing. Um, yeah, if you have time, I mean, you're welcome to stay another like five minutes, uh, Valerie and Veronica, but if you have to go, we completely understand. I can so. I can stay, I have no, no issue, yeah, for sure. Okay. Um, I guess I, yeah. I also have a question for, or something I would like Valerie to discuss is some like downsides of the, uh, different conformal prediction methods. I think we like briefly touched on them, but. Uh... Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the the most funny thing is like there is <laughs> people, uh, you know, sometimes don't believe it, but as, I mean, it's it's almost like no downsides, right? The, the biggest, yeah. uh, uh, it's not even like a downside, you know, there is uh, there is only one, uh, one only like uh, user input in into framework, right, into any model. And that is uh, selecting non-conformity measure, right? So somebody asked a very good question, right? You know, like uh, how do we, 
how do we actually like, you know, in classification task, imagine that we are doing multi-class, like, you know, you were just presenting, and we are like interested, uh, you know, in different things from, from uh, for example, business perspective, right? How do we actually uh, like, um, what business metric do we use from business perspective? Do we actually like um, uh, minimize on average the size of this uh, sets, right? Uh, an alternative uh, would be uh, we want to maximize, for example, the, the share of singletons, right? Uh, you know, because they're like two different things, right? And, you know, the, 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 the key difference comes from using the non-conformity metric, right? The non-conformity metric is uh, is uh, quite important, right? Uh, so there are like very simple me metrics, but there are also like uh, model dependent metrics and model independent metrics, right? Some of them have uh, been covered in, um, in uh, scientific papers, you know, some of them are like on the payable. So in my book, actually, one of the things I'm explaining, uh, which uh, I haven't seen anywhere been covered, you know, in, in tutorials elsewhere, uh, you know, if you want to maximize the share of singletons, which metric do we use, right? Or contrary, if you want to minimize uh, the the, um, the size of the predictions sets, uh, we can use another metric, right? So this is like the, uh, the only input, and it's like a skill or the art, right? So of course, selecting the best, um, Conformity, non-conformity metric for specific uh, business problem is is uh, can make things better, right? This is the only like um, uh, discretion that people have, right? And this is like where data scientists can actually contribute by designing the metric, perhaps uh, in in combination with business experts to 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 help improve the uh, the efficiency of predictors, right? So we get a calibration validity by default. Uh, but the, the width of prediction regions is actually coming out of uh, of uh, several things. Uh, how uncertain your data? How good is your prediction model? Right. Of course, if if the the point prediction model is not very good, the, the <laughs> conform prediction will still provide valid intervals. They will just not be very very good because you know the underlying model is is not capturing the the point predictions very well. And the third thing is is actually non-conformity metric. Right. So this is like three in, uh, two ingredients of success. And uh, the, the skill is like evaluated by data scientists is actually using the correct me metric to, to do that, right? So I hope that answers the question, yeah, Veronica. Yeah. I'm actually trying to answer a question right now too, which I think is um, a good, a really good question from Arthur. Uh, he said, are there any guidelines like lower bound for the size of the calibration sets? Um, and I just emulated what I saw, like the examples on the documentation for Mappy doing, but mm. I'm sure it's like not something that's been like officially established. No. Uh, yes, the uh, the width of prediction sets is uh, is usually uh, can be measured, uh, um, you know, by experiments. But more interestingly, uh, just a few days ago, I posted a, a paper, which is a brand new paper. There is no code implementation or anything, right? Uh, which actually can predict the width of uh, prediction sets uh, themselves, right? And that is actually quite powerful. So, you know, I hope at one point the, uh, uh, either the authors would share this code or somebody will implement uh, will implement it in Maple or somewhere else, right? Because, you know, it would be good to know kind of a priori if we just kind of uh, give a data set to, to the model, right? This model, it can predict actually the uh, the 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 size of the of the prediction sets, right? And this is a very very powerful. So they they run uh, they created this model, they run these experiments, uh, uh, you know, and uh, it was pretty spot on. So it was quite amazing, you know, uh, people did that. So they actually there is mass now to predict the 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 size of prediction sets as well. So which is great. That's yeah, that's great. Okay, uh, yeah, ECP is something that can be saved and used in email service later on another platform. I, I'm not quite sure I understood this. Um, I mean, yeah, there are, there are some libraries. Um, CP is a framework, right? Uh, it's like different models for different applications. Of course, uh, there are like in, in different companies models in production. There is also like open source libraries. Uh, um for even like on uh, things like microsoft azure actually when people use anomaly de detection they don't realize it's been powered by conform prediction actually for, for a long time so um you know it's uh, pa papers from wolfk uh, that um, invented this technology so what else is there let me just check thank you thank you that's great a recording will be available in a couple of days i think um it is possible to share slides. Yes, I have them available. Just a second, I'll just share them now. So here are the slides. Yeah, good question from Martin. I think it's not a straightforward answer. 
I mean, conditional coverage is a um, specific area, right? Um, I guess here it's secure, but there is also like algorithms that deliver empirical guarantees for coverage, which means they work most of the time, but not always. <laughs> right. Yeah, Martin, I'll reach out to you. If you can repost to my LinkedIn, I'll, I'll think about the small specific. I think it's very specific. Okay, value in using multiple quantiles. Um, yeah, I mean, um, for quantiles, we have CQR, of course, very powerful, right? But that doesn't provide the whole curve. Uh, if people are interested in, in kind of more information beyond uh, quantiles, I would suggest uh, to look into uh, conform predictive distributions. I actually have a medium article on that, and um, we can use a um, library called Krebs, which is a French for pancakes, and it's like literally just a couple of uh, lines of code. Yeah, so does it make sense to learn the best metric? Uh, I guess this relates to non-conformity measure. It makes sense to learn in a data-driven way, right? But there is also some, some guidelines, right? There is uh, um, some metrics um, tend to work better than, than others, regardless of um, of the model, right? So there is some research, and I'm covering this in, in my in, in my book in more detail. There is like some metrics that are kind of known to work better on average, right? And this is like mostly sufficient for most applications. I guess I, I covered everything, right? Uh, the question about Spark, uh, I'm not aware um, of there being a comprehensive library for uh, conform prediction in Spark, yet there has been some, some like, uh, yes, Scala CP has been mentioned. I'm not aware of, of anything else, um, but um, most of the things are available in Python and R, and there is also a library in Julia. Yeah, I think I covered everything. Okay, that's good. Anything else from, from the audience? So. Veronica. Um, I think we're good. I feel like there's there's like some questions that we might have missed, but okay, yeah. I mean, I I can only add. I mean, if if people do have some extra questions, uh, you know, uh, I think the best place to ask questions is conform prediction Slack. Uh, because it's not just me, right? I, I, I literally don't have, unfortunately, time to answer. And sometimes people, uh, if they ask me questions, they're related to try to answer. Sometimes, you know, it's like very questions that are unrelated. Uh, but uh, I mean, the Slack, uh, you know, is 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 very friendly community for uh, confirmed prediction. Uh, and it's it has both like researchers, including some of the uh, best known researchers, like uh, who invented like CQR and things like this. Uh, and it's also very friendly to to beginners as well. So you're most welcome to um, uh, to join Slack. Uh, in Slack, uh, you know, people, people can answer questions uh, just beyond me as well because I might know everything, right? But uh, uh, you know, Anastasios might know some things that I don't know, right? Uh, or somebody else. And uh, it's very friendly uh, and very welcoming community, both for like beginners, but also like um, kind of intermediate level uh, folks and and even like an experts, right? So most welcome to join, uh, learn and ask questions and just be part of the of the journey, right? And uh, this is the whole idea of, of, of this community. Uh, and uh, it's also like materials posted, you know, all the papers that you see, all the developments that I post on LinkedIn and Twitter, by all means uh, connect and follow. Uh, and I try to repost them uh, as much as possible in, in a Slack channel as well. So you have everything in one place, uh, but of course it gets deleted after a while <laughs> because it's a free Slack, right? <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you again for inviting. It was a pleasure and uh, I really enjoyed it. It was awesome and uh, yeah, I really enjoyed the, the kind of uh, engagement from the audience. And thank you very much again, uh, Micheline and Veronica, for organizing everything. I know it's it's not easy to, to put events like this together. So yes, uh, thank you very much again.